takes always, takes always some time to log in uh, Zoom. It's uh, great to have you all here. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Mara Airoldi, and I'm the academic director of the Government Outcomes Lab here at the Blavatsky School of Government. It's my absolute privilege to, to welcome each one of you to this uh, Indigo Hack and Learn Summer Edition 2023. As you might have noticed, the session is uh, being recorded so that we can make it available for those who can't participate uh, at the session today. As uh, some of you know, the Hack and Learn is one of the key events that we host uh, as part of the Indigo Initiative uh, here at the Government Outcomes Lab. Indigo is a data and learning community and uh, the key motivation that draws this community together is uh, the data, but also uh, the learning that we do together. This learning is a learning aim at improving how we share data and learn from this data in order to understand how we can achieve better outcomes and uh, how to tackle complex social problems that uh, um, our society are uh, confronted with. So for, before we start, I would like to hear from you who you are. So feel free to put in the chat uh, your name, the organization or the country you're coming from, and uh, welcome um, everyone. Some uh, little housekeeping rule before we get going is that uh, I invite each one of you to stay muted unless you're taking the floor. When we have the Q&A, we will invite you to speak, but unless you're asked to speak, please uh, uh, mute. And if you can, please keep the camera on. We intentionally organize this session as a Zoom meeting, not a webinar, because uh, we like to be a community. We want to see each other's face. We want to know who is online and reach out and chat with uh, everybody. So it's a very open meeting. Please keep your camera on if you can. Uh, next, here we are, the agenda, as you can see here. Uh, this is what's uh, gonna happen in the next hour. The little bird here is a real bird. It's an indigo bunting and is our uh, mascot for today. And uh, it represents an invitation to, uh, I would have said a tweet, but I think today we, sh we should say exit or whatever is the new language on this new X platform. Uh, share, disseminate about the hack and learn in your social media on LinkedIn or invite colleagues to join some of the challenges if you think they're interesting. Uh, the plan for today is to do the introduction to the Hack and Learn event. And uh, some of you uh, have done this before, and uh, for some of you, this is completely the first uh, step. So there will be some tips on how to make the most of a Hack and Learn event. The opportunity that you have today is to listen from the leaders of these challenges uh, what is the challenge is about, and their task today is to persuade you that uh, you should join their challenge. Um, you can ask questions about the sessions at the end, uh, uh, and at the end there will be an open Q and A. How and uh, we will also in, explain how you join a challenge. We use it Slack, and there will, there will be a time to stay online to make sure that you know how to be part of, uh, of the challenge. And you will have technical support that is available today and throughout the Hack and Learn challenge. So we are uh, ready to start. But before we start, I wonder if anybody has an immediate question. Okay, we have a slide here on uh, how the Hack and Learn is uh, gonna run. We are, uh, today is the kickoff session, 13 of September. And after this uh, kickoff uh, session, we will do the hacking or we call it a uh, hack, 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 but actually is learn, learn, learn as well. Uh, it will uh, last until the 28th of September where we will reconvene to do a show and tell. And we will also write the reflection and blog following up to capture the learning that we've been doing. And often some of these learning become um, part of a future development. But before we go into the session, I just want to welcome our co-host for this Hack and Learn uh, event for this summer. 
who is co-hosted by Inspire Matrices in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and uh, the South African Medical Research Council. So I will I will pass the microphone to Georgie to briefly introduce himself. Georgie, can I pass the microphone to you? Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Georgie. I'm I'm a researcher at Inspire Matrices and a data steward at the Go Lab in Latin America. Inspire is an independent, no-profit institution located in Brazil dedicated to education and research in the fields of business, administration, economics, law, and engineering. So in the last years, we have been working on the subject of outcome-based contracting and started to work together with the Go Lab in some activities, including the Hack and Learn. So we already worked together in some Hack and Learns and we had some very interesting results. So we were we are very happy to co-host this event again. Thank you, Mara. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you, Sri, for the invitation. And congratulations for this initiative. So let's have a good time and let's hack and learn. Thank you very much, Mara. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you for the enthusiasm. So I'll pass the microphone to Neville Inslinger from the South African Medical Research Council for a, a quick Thank you. Thank you. Here we go. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Nevlin Slingers. Um, I work at the South African Medical Research Council. Uh, we focus on research and innovation to improve health outcomes. Um, more recently, we've started focusing on innovation in financing for health. And this is how we come to focus on outcomes-based contracting and other forms of innovative financing. We have started by um, developing an impact bond focusing on um, HIV and teenage pregnancy outcomes in adolescent girls and young women. And we have just launched that a few months ago and are going strong. And now we're focusing on building an ecosystem to encourage and initiate other um, similar forms of innovative financing in South Africa and hopefully in Africa as well. As part of this, uh, we have started collaborating with GoLab and that's been quite a fine for us. Um, and it's been great collaborating. Um, and through that collaboration, we have a data steward who, who is based in South Africa, who is helping us think through and set up the data and as we work to identify what information people need, uh, we work to be able to uh, meet people's requirements. So we look forward to being part of the second learn. It's the first time we being part, we are participating, and I'm excited to see I'm actually joining from the GoLab offices in in Oxford, seeing as we are wanting to participate in the Social Outcomes Conference, which starts tomorrow as an opportunity to learn from everybody else. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn, and welcome, and welcome to Oxford. I'll uh, pause and I'll pass the microphone to Shri, that can talk us through a little bit uh, about the Hack and Learn, already give you an overview of the phases, but what are the tips for those of you who are first timers? Thank you, Mara. Um, first of all, like I really want to welcome like everyone who's joining today. Uh, we're really excited to have you all joining us. Um, as Mara said, I wanna share some hack and learn tips, especially if this is the first time you're participating. Uh, some of you may have already been part of many hack and learn before, so you may already be familiar with the tips. Um, so the first, um, choose one challenge as your primary challenge. I know all the challenges are super interesting and all of them may be very re relevant to you and to your work. Um, sometimes you want to join the challenge because you want to be part of them all, but you can end up having a lot to do. So it might be frustrating not to, uh, for you because you wouldn't have enough time to work on uh, the challenges. So the idea here is that you join uh, one challenge, you pick one, join one, but you could also always join the other one to be part of the conversation. Uh, so make sure to let your challenge leader know which of the challenges you're actively working on and which one of the challenge that 
you're there to be part of the conversation. Uh, tip number two is your challenge leader is your main point of help. So if you need any help with anything, for example, if you need help with Slack or if you have any questions or doubts, you should feel free to ask your challenge leader any question you want to ask them. Um, and third tip uh, for the show and tell session, which will be happening, as Mara said, on 28th September 2023, uh, your team will get a 10 minute to share your results. We don't really expect you to have a final solution for a lot of like complex challenges that we would be addressing during these challenges. But if there's something like a work in progress or the lessons you learned, uh, those would be enough to share during the show and tell. So the main focus of the event, like Hack and Learn itself is the learning. So of course, like um, your learning and what you're learning throughout these two weeks would be more than enough to share, not like a final result. Like, so that's the expectation. Uh, so the final tip is that while you're working on your challenges, it is good to write down your thoughts about the experience that can be part of the blog that Mara kind of mentioned before. So we'll be writing a blog that will be hosted in GoLab um, website. So it would always be easy to write your thoughts and what you're experiencing throughout the challenge so that you can write them, compile them into a blog later on. So those are the tips from my side. I really don't want to take any more time as we have a very packed agenda today. So back to you, Mara. Thank you, Sri. And uh, I'm guilty of following too many challenges. We've been uh, very selective this year to prevent us joining too many challenges and focus our energy in really making a difference. Um, and although it's only two weeks and the two weeks of the Hack and Learn will really fly, we are uh, really lucky because we have the support of open data services that will give the technical side uh, help with the visualization. So maybe you are involved in a hack and learn challenge and you would like to represent the information in a way that is uh, clear to the audience. Well, we have uh, James and Lima who will uh, follow us and uh, give us ideas on what we can do with the data, how we can represent it, how we can explain, how can we analyze. And I'll, do you want to say hello, James and Lima? And talk a little bit about the support you give. Uh, sure. Hello. So I'm uh, based up in Edinburgh, the universe down in Oxford. Uh, so yeah, so we're, uh, so yeah, it's just really good to work with people over the Hack and Learns and hear people's different experiences uh, of, of this area. Um, we can help with uh, sort of the data and what's, uh, what, you know, just what it could do and ideas and help you, basically help you sort of realize your ideas and uh, make, uh, make, yeah, give you some examples of visualizations. Thank you, James. Nilima, you want to add anything? Can we hear your little voice? Thanks, Mara. Yeah, exactly what James said. So a specific example was working with the team last year and we did an amazing um, dashboard, uh, which was pages of visualizations, which of course we couldn't represent them all, but it was still fun for me to make and for them to choose from. So looking forward to working again this time. Thank you, guys. Indeed, it's fascinating to see how the visualization takes place uh, and takes shapes. It's like a prototype, but it's really, really exciting. And it, it happens live while you are on the challenge. So now, without further ado, I will now la launch us in our two challenges. They are challenges 31 and 32. We keep numbering them as we go along. But this is, uh, there is a truck uh an important history behind us on these uh, challenges and uh, more of them to come two are presented today for this edition of the hack and learn each leader has been given 10 minutes to give you the highlight and the overview of what the challenge is about and what they aim to achieve by the end of the two weeks the first challenge being presented today here is called Show Me the Money, a data harvest of impact bond funding arrangement. And Harry is uh, pitching the challenge to you. Over to you, Harry. Okay, thanks, Mara. Hi, everyone. I'm Harry Rigazzi. I'm a postdoctoral researcher 
here at the Go Lab, and I'm joined today by Jonathan Ung, who is a lawyer at the US Agency for International Development, and we're the co-leads on this challenge. So I'll outline the problem, what we're, what we're trying to address here, what we'll do, and perhaps most importantly, why we're, we're wanting to address this problem of um, the type of capital used in impact bonds, uh, and convince you in that process that this is the challenge that I know you'll all certainly join. So. Let's begin with an outline of the problem then. So I'm going to perform now for you a short play that I've just written, which is uh, represents a conversation that I've had on a couple of different occasions with different people. I'm gonna play all the parts. This is my debut, so get ready. Okay, so an impact bond. It's a financial bond, right? I mean, it's in the title. Well, not quite. So it, it's more like uh, another sort of investment. Hmm, interesting. An equity stake in a social enterprise? Well, sort of. It's hard to say because we don't have much data about how the finance is actually arranged. Uh, I'm confused. Well, me too, to be honest. So this is what we see as the problem. We're confused too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we use the, the language of investment. But the actual structure of these financial mechanisms is strange. So they, they appear to have similarities to a debt. Uh, they have some similarities to an equity stake, but they're not really synonymous with either. Um, and as Jonathan put the question to me when we first spoke about this, are they not actually more like a series of grant fund exchanges? So the outcomes pay, the, the service provider needs some upfront capital to begin providing the service. The outcomes payer will pay that money back depending on, on outcomes achieved, but is, there might not be any actual investment being done. And crucially, there's not clarity on this matter. So really the purpose here is we want to get some clarity on this to get under the shiny wrapper of the, you know, the innovative um, uh, impact bonds and find out what's going on inside. So how will we do this then? Just move along to the next slide, please, uh, Shri. Well, first, we need to look at the existing data we have. So the Indigo database, um, the impact bond database, has a variable investment type. Uh, and the options for that variable are debt, equity, or combination. Um, so the first task will be simply to collate that information, uh, how many of the 283 impact bonds have provided that information. We'll see what's there. Um, but already we'll be thinking about, is, are those categories enough? We might need another category, probably grant, or, or we'll, we'll see what kind of uh, other language our, our contacts use when they're describing the, the financial mechanism. But having got that first basic picture of what's there, we'll then begin to try and increase our knowledge by searching for more information on this. So that might involve uh, contacting stakeholders who we, who we have details for, for the different projects and just asking them, can you tell us about the, the way the finance is arranged? Uh, we can search in existing documentation to see if there's any information in there. We can try to use the GoLab's machine learning tool to help us do this. this a, there's a question mark on this because sometimes it's work, sometimes it's not as, not as helpful, but we can try and use that to see if that can help us with the search. Um, and then on that basis, we should have a better picture of, uh, of the type of capital that is being used, and it will allow us to develop maybe some visualizations to summarize the current state of the knowledge on this question. And then we begin to reflect about those findings, think about what they tell us about these tools and maybe the advantages or disadvantages. And that's part of why we're even concerned with this. Why, why should we be worrying about, about this seemingly small technical matter? Uh, and for us, it all relates to the question of the risks and the benefits of using the so-called innovative finance in public service provision um, and making sure that the assessment and discussion is based on a clear understanding of the nature of that innovation. I think that's what we don't have at the moment. And uh, I think for more details on the why, we can uh, go now to my, to my colleague here, Jonathan. So as I say, uh, Jonathan's a senior legal counsel at USAID. And USAID has been the outcomes payer on some impact bonds, and as well as in more traditional um, grant funding. 
So how the financing of services is arranged is not just a matter of curiosity for them, for, for Jonathan. It's, it's about identifying the most effective ways of dispersing the annual aid budget. And that's a matter of immense practical importance. It's not just intellectual curiosity that brings Jonathan to the table. Um, so I don't know if you want to add anything here on the on the why you think this is important. Or... Sure, yeah, no, it's great to be with you all. And in the spirit of persuasion, um, know that I flew in just from Washington, D.C. to join you all <laughs> here to help persuade you to join this challenge. Um, and then Harry told me, well, by the way, this is virtual. So, um, <laughs> but still my commitment is strong. I am here in person. Um, and would love to continue working with, uh, would love to work with any of you who, who do decide to sign up for this challenge. As Harry was mentioning, though, this is about simplification, you know, cutting through the noise. What are we trying to accomplish at the end of the day with an impact bond? It's about a structure, but trying to help people at the end of the day, full stop. So how is it that these structures are helping to do that? Um, and so diving into this crucial detail that's often overlooked in terms of the type of capital that is involved will help us uh, be able to assess to what extent impact bonds um, are useful and how innovation is actually happening in a funding structure like impact bonds. The other issue too, I work at USAID as Harry mentioned, we are fundamentally a donor agency. We are not a finance institution. And so sometimes the language of finance overtakes what we're trying to do in international development. And so we need to take a step back at times and say, is this really about more creative grant making or to what extent are, is finance truly involved here? So that helps to, hopefully helps to, to clarify a little bit more about this challenge. And I'll turn it back over to Harry. Perfect. Thanks, Jonathan. So that, that just about wraps things up. Um, let's dig into this. Let's uh, contribute to the clarity that is, that is needed in order to be able to have the, the critical conversation about this matter. So join Challenge 31 and very much looking forward to working with you over the next couple of weeks. Thank you, Harry and Jonathan. And I invite everybody to put the questions for this challenge in the chat. And uh, I'll come back to the question after we've been through the challenges. Um, I already have two, but I'll come to my questions later. So this was a challenge uh, 31, and now we'll move to challenge number 32. Um, after having seen the money with challenge 31, we are looking at the outcomes with challenge 32. Rethinking changes and adaptation in a social impact bond. And we have uh, Juliana, who is uh, presenting and persuading you to join this challenge. Juli. Great. Thanks, Mara. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Juliana. I work here at the Go Lab, and I will be leading challenge number 32, uh, which is all about thinking about changes and adaptations in social impact bonds. I am not sure I can compete with Harry's theater play, but I will do my best. Um, the title of this challenge is Rethinking Changes and Adaptations. And this is why we think it's important. One of the big ideas, uh, the big ideas or the big promises around social impact bonds was that they would give more flexibility to the service provider to innovate, uh, to find new ways of working and to adapt to unexpected challenges. So for example, COVID has been a huge challenge to the social impact bonds that were delivering a service during the pandemic. And I could name many other unexpected challenges that could happen when you're running one of these uh, social impact bonds. So the question that we are trying to address here is how do social impact bonds adapt to unex unexpected challenges or unexpected circumstances? We already know that they do change and they do adapt. And we are. this is a list of all the changes that we identify and we have seen some impact bonds doing this type of changes. So sometimes we see changes in targets. Usually when you set an outcome metric, you have a target or you have a, an expectation around the number of individuals who will achieve that outcome. And we have seen that sometimes these projects change these targets both up and down. Sometimes they negotiate the targets down, but sometimes they go up. Sometimes they receive further allocations, they receive further funding, and they could have higher targets at the end of the project. We have also seen that prices go up and down during the life of these projects. Sometimes are, some outcomes are really hard to achieve, so the commissioner recognized that maybe the outcome is worth a higher price, and sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes the commissioner thinks that some outcomes are worth 
a different price. There are also changes in the description of the cohort. Sometimes projects, when they are in the middle of delivery, they decide to be more strict with the cohort and maybe they only want to work with young people between 18 and 25 year old. And sometimes they want to have a bigger cohort and they decide to work with people from 18 to 40 year old. And this changes the description of the outcome metric. It also changes the description of the cohort. There are changes in the validation methods sometimes. Sometimes the outcome metrics, uh, you don't need to do much to, to show proof that you achieved an outcome or that a person achieved an outcome. Some outcomes are proved with self-certification provided by the same person. And sometimes you, you have some methods that are, a bit, uh, that are more strict. For example, if you are doing a social impact bond on employment, maybe people need to present a certificate saying that they got a job for you to achieve an outcome. So these validation methods could be harder or could be easier depending on the social impact bond contract. We have also seen changes in the timing of outcome payments. Sometimes you are supposed to get the outcome payments once the service delivery is done, and sometimes they change that and you can actually get your payments before, or sometimes you can get them later. This usually changes across the life of the program. All this list is here to show you that there are lots of changes and they happen because these projects need to adapt to different circumstances. And that's what we would like to capture. But now you would ask, how good is our impact bond data set to capture all these changes and this evolution in time? And if I have to be honest, I will tell you it's not so good or it's not so good yet. If you look at the slide, this is the template that we complete every time uh, we have a social impact bond sharing data with us. So there is an outcome definition. There is a description of the outcome that is supposed to be achieved. There is a target population. L let's think of a practical example. An outcome definition could be you want individuals to get a formal job and it could be a full-time job. The target population is unemployed people and maybe it could be unemployed people between 18 and 40 year old. And then the target number of service users expected to achieve that outcome could vary, but let's say that you're running a project where 100 people are expected to achieve this outcome. And in any type of targeted service user, you would say these are individuals. These are not families, not households. These are individuals. Sometimes there are other targets for meeting outcome metrics. This is not the case. And then you would say how to validate this outcome, how to prove that you achieve this outcome. And there could be different ways, but usually the person needs to present a certificate of the new job. As you can see here, I have rows and every row needs to take one outcome metric. At the moment, the data model looks like this. Every row is one outcome metric and I can only have one outcome metric, one target per outcome metric, one price and one validation method. What we would like to do and what we need to do to make sure that the data model can capture the evolution in time of social impact bonds is to rethink the data model. We need to include some new columns and we need to think how to make it work so that in the future we can capture the following situation. There is a metric, but there could be two targets. Maybe between March and December of the first year, there was this target. And between January and December of the following year, there was a different target. And we would like to be able to capture both of them and to know between when and when they were valid. Maybe this target, maybe this metric at the beginning was worth a uh, hundred pounds. And then it was so difficult to achieve that it was worth 150 and then it was 200. We would really like to keep track of all these changes, but we need to adapt the data model if we want to have a better idea around adaptations with social impact bonds. The output or what we want to do now is just to write a proposal. We're going to be working very closely to James and Elima from Open Data Services. And we're just going to write what the data model should, should look like in the future to see these changes. We don't expect to finish these two weeks with the data model changed or improved. We are just writing a proposal so we can keep working on this and we can start implementing the changes um, very smoothly. But we're just finishing our challenge with a great proposal and we expect to show this proposal in two weeks and we are going to be thinking very carefully of every single one of these changes that I mentioned. This challenge is going to be very focused on a data model. So if you join this challenge, you should be prepared to do lots of thinking around 
variables and data models and data definitions and how different pieces of data link and connect to each other. I think this is fantastic, uh, but you can choose. Challenge 31 also looks great, but this is, this is the challenge where we're really going to be doing a big difference. Uh, that's it for me. I would recommend you to keep my email because sometimes there are some problems when you are trying to join Slack. If you can't join Slack, please keep my email so I can, uh, me or maybe Shri can help you later. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think this is back to you, Mara. Thank you, Juliana. And thank you, Harry and uh, Jonathan as well for presenting the challenge. It's very difficult to choose having two. Um, if I will uh, pause a second, if there is any question, feel free to put it in the in the chat. Uh, at the end of this call, we will uh, send instructions on how to join. So if you have a problem joining, you will have uh, contacts in your inbox of people you might want to write to, uh, to get some help in, uh, in joining the challenges. But uh, I'll, uh, I asked uh, a couple of questions in the chat that uh, Harry already replied for uh, challenge number 31. If um, I give you a few seconds to raise your hand if you want to ask a clarification question. Okay, it seems all is uh, clear. Um, I'll, uh, I'll pass the microphone to you, Shri. Uh, can you talk us through how, in practice, we can join these uh, challenges? And uh, feel free to put questions in the chat. We will have some minutes at the end as well. Sri, over to you. Thank you, Mara. Um, I will I will go through the how to join the Slack channel, as Mara mentioned. And my colleague, Nikki, posted the link to join as well. So. We'll just go through step by step that um, then you'll know what, what to expect next. So once you click the link, uh, link, so this is what you would see. We have a screenshot of uh, the first page that appears. Um, and again, like throughout this kind of process of us walking through, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand or put them in the chat as well. Uh, again, using Slack is like, very intuitive and it is there to make things easier so we can communicate with each other, communicate within the group and also ask for help if you need. So there's often like very engaging discussions happening within Slack as well. So it's really easy for us to communicate. Um, and next slide, please. So once you click the link and put in the email address that you want to register, um, you would need to go through some verification. So the verification is there would be a code sent to your email. So you'll receive like a six number code or a six letter number combination code. Either way, like once you input that in um, the Slack um, interface, you'll see welcome to GoLab University of Oxford. Um, I hope so far it's good. I'm gonna check as well. Okay, next slide, please. And next you'll see these two interface. That's just like the Slack interface and it'll show you like, this is your team. Um, few of our faces are there, James and my face. So you might see a few others as well. So you can click if you know someone, but if not, don't worry about it. Sorry for the background noises. I think those are the sign that more people are joining in. So I'm getting notification, uh, apologies for that. So next slide, please. So, and then to join the channel, so on your left-hand side, you will see all channels. So if you can click that, um, or if you're not able to see all channels, there will be like a more button underneath. So if you're able to click more and join through there, you will be able to see all channels. So, and once you click channel, and then on the right-hand side, you'll be able to see the different channels. So especially if you're joining the first time, the uh, GoLab channel, you'll be seeing the latest two channel, uh, two challenges. Next slide, please. Uh, and these are the code for the specific challenges. So we have Act Team 31, Show Me the Money, and Hack Team 32. So if you see those two, uh, you'll be able to see two buttons, View and Join. Make sure to click Join if you're joining uh, the challenge. 
And the screenshots down um, in this slide are what you would see. So you can say hi or like just say hello to the, to the team and this would be the interface you would be communicating. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and we also have two additional channels. So if you need any help with data, any technical help, we have a channel called Hack Technical Help. So this is another, we'll share these uh, different channel names as well, if you're not able to capture it now. So if you need any help in terms for data or any technical help, uh, this is the channel to post your questions. And James and Nilima would be helping to resolve any technical uh, issues that, that are coming up throughout these two weeks. And also if you want to uh, interact with other participants from other challenge, uh, we have a networking launch. So this is somewhere you can join, uh, share kind of about yourself and make new friends uh, from different challenges. Uh, that's all from my side. And again, Slack is meant to be very intuitive and very easy to use. And we are here to help. Feel, please feel free to like email um, me or Juliana if you're not able to join Slack. And back to you, Mara. Thank you, Shri. Can I do a room check of uh, those of you trying to join? Uh, can you give me the thumbs up or down if you manage? Because I'm already signed up, so it's difficult for me to see how complicated it is because I'm already there. So Nikki had no problem. Abdulakim as well. Gisela, fantastic. So it seems to be working. Uh, if you did not manage, don't worry. As I said, we will send an email. There will be a link to this video, so you can revisit the video. You can reply to that email or reach uh, Huli or Sri, and uh, we can jump on a call with you and uh, and guide you through. Sometimes uh, is, uh, installing it might be a bit uh, clumsy, especially on different machines. So I'll... Uh, Pause. Those are our challenges. Those is the way in which you can participate on uh, those challenges. I'll, uh, I'll just, uh, I just want to pause and uh, give you a chance to share your thinking, impression. Have you already made up your mind on which challenges you're going to join and why? And what you expect from this Hack and Learn? Believe it or not, we are a very informal and friendly community. Yeah, I agree, Andrea. Hard to choose for me too. I've been assigned to one because I think people know me. So, so you go to this one. Oh, hi. So can everyone hear me? So my name is Leon. I'm from um, Institute of Policy Studies in Singapore. I'm really interested in Challenge 32. I've really signed up for it. Um, I think where, where I'm coming from is um, I think it's important to broaden I think policymakers' ideas of what outcomes-based financing projects look like. So we need to, I think it's important to give them um, a richer picture of what actually happens on the ground um, so that um, so they, so we can clear up some, a lot of the misconceptions around social impact bonds and really show that um, there's, uh, that there's a lot of promise in uh, collaboration and in um, building shared outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Thank you for sharing. One of the research projects we are working on and uh, is, uh, is related to the relational nature of this type of contract. And in the relational nature, there is some changes that take place. So it would be great to document those. Any other comments or questions? Okay, well, you can ask your question on the Slack channel when you join. They tend to be very lively exchanges. So before uh, closing the session today, 
I would like to make two announcements. One, as Nevelin was saying earlier, um, to the tomorrow we uh, will be in conference mode. It's a social outcome conference 2023 for the rest of the week. So I would expect uh, the Slack channel channels to be quite quiet because we are all busy with a very packed agenda. If you haven't signed up to the conference yet, uh, can, can we put a link in the chat? Uh, please do have a look at the program. It is uh, absolutely exciting and you can join online or in Oxford. Um, but uh, joining online is free of charge. Look at the program, it's really worth attending and uh, we hope to see a number of you there. And as part of the conference in particular, there is a, um, uh, a session, a plenary session, that is looking at the data and indigo and is called putting the puzzle together, piecing together data and evidence in outcome-based contracting. This uh, session is on Friday at uh, quarter past 11 in the morning, UK time. Um, you might be particularly interested in this session or others. As I said, have a look on uh, and the program and I hope to you see as many as you there um, starting tomorrow. And with this, I just thank you for uh, joining us and humoring us in uh, this uh, uh, theatre performance today. And I look forward to seeing you on the 28th of September to see what we came up with for these two challenges. Um, enjoy your uh, hacking and learning. It's all from me.